All right, we're gonna get started. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, I'm loving the participation here. This is a very popular session, it looks like. So uh, we're excited to get started. Welcome to day three of uh, ProCon 2021. We're thrilled you're all joining us for a changing world, engaging active agers on their fitness journey. My name is Jordan Lanziski, and I'm the deputy director of the experience team at JCC Association of North America. I'm gonna do a little bit of housekeeping and then I'm gonna throw it over to the Life Fitness team. This session is being recorded. We understand that some people do not wish to be recorded, in which case you may turn off your camera, but we're encouraging you to keep it on so that we can feel like we're all together. Um, and this is gonna be a great session. You can earn a continuing education credit, so make sure you pay attention. Um, if this is not the session you intended to join, please return to spot me and select a different session. Joining me today from JCC Association is Dr. Andy Mizels, Director of Special Projects. Our names appear as the host at the top of your participant list, and you can chat with either of us to address any needs or questions. We aspire for everyone to feel that they belong at ProCon 2021 um, and are working to build inclusive spaces. So we invite you to rename yourself in Zoom with your name, your agency, and if you're comfortable, adding your preferred personal pronouns. We've also enabled the closed captioning and you have the option at the bottom toolbar to turn that option off. Please reach out to Andy or myself um, in chat if there's anything we can do to enhance your learning experience. We're thrilled to offer this multifaceted conference to you at no cost which was made possible because of our generous sponsors. So we thank Life Fitness family of brands for being a ProCon 2021 sponsor. And we encourage you to connect with Stacy and Forrest by visiting the Life Fitness booth during the virtual vendor hall hour, which is taking place right after this session from 1.45 to 2.45 PM Eastern. Um, and we'll put a link at the bottom uh, in the chat after this session is over so you can take you there. As I mentioned before, pay particular attention in this session because you can receive one CEC by taking a quiz following the session. Uh, we've discovered that the way that we enter this session through the platform um, into Zoom doesn't directly allow us to track email addresses. So I'm going to pop a link into the chat. Um, make sure you enter your email address in there so that you can make sure to receive the um, quiz that's going to come afterwards so that you can receive your CEC credit for this session. In this session, Stacy Carter, a physical therapy and senior living expert, will share demographic changes with e emphasis on the baby boomer population growth, programming considerations for individuals with joint mobility conditions, impacts of falls, risk factors for falls, and some programming considerations for fall risk reduction. And lastly, the importance of brain health for older adults and activities to engage the mind and the body. But first, I will introduce Forrest Corey, who's a regional segment manager for the JCC, YMCA, and hospital wellness segment of Life Fitness. Forrest, over to you. Thanks, Jordan. And a quick mic check or a thumbs up. Can you hear me? All right, that's awesome. Well, welcome to our enrichment elective JCCs of North America. We are thrilled that you've chosen to spend a, a piece of your time here with us, with Stacy and I from Life Fitness and our family of brands. As Jordan just so eloquently uh, stated tonight, today we'll be focusing on a changing world. And what we mean is how we're engaging you know, active agers on their fitness journey, especially as we think about them coming uh, out of the pandemic. And, you know, um, now that they have their vaccines in many places and many regions, they're some of the first people that we've seen come back and all the conversations uh, that we are currently having as the world slowly, very slowly returns uh, to normal. So again, as Jordan said, uh, you'll have the opportunity to earn one CEC for this session. Make sure that you put your email address in that form so that we can follow up. You'll receive an email from us. You'll also receive the recording. And so this is important. If you've got uh, trainer staff or really anybody that needs a CEC or would benefit from this education, you can forward them that recording. They can watch the recording and then take the quiz. And then they'll be able to use those CECs for ACE and NASM and all the normal CEC uh, certification groups. So that's a key one as well. So if they can't physically attend this or they're at another uh, session right now, that CEC and of course the learning is still available um, and to them, you know, after the fact. So 
Uh, without further ado, I thought it would be helpful here to introduce myself and my counterpart, Gary Kilowanowski. So Gary and I oversee uh, For Life Fitness, the entire country from the nonprofit segment. So we work directly with JCCs as well as YMCAs, uh, Salvation Army, Croc Centers, and Hospital Wellness. He and I split the co country basically by uh, the Mississippi is the best way to say it. I'm on the east based in Charlottesville, Virginia. I've been with Life Fitness for over uh, almost a decade. Hard to say that out loud. It feels like 10 days sometimes. <laughs> Uh, Gary started with Cybex and now with Life Fitness when we acquired Cybex, um, that was uh, about 12, 13 years ago, if I remember correctly. So some of you already know Gary, some of you already know me, and we are so glad that you're here because we personally invited you. But this is, if this is our first time meeting, we're available for anything that you need from training, education, service and support, of course, product information, all of those things. Uh, make sure that you come say hey to us at the, the virtual vendor hour. For this focus, this is one of the key pillars for us at Life Fitness is how we um, provide training and education. And we kind of do that in a couple of different buckets uh, from Life Fitness Academy. That's our group combined with the Cybex Research Institute where we can do on-site product training. We can do virtual training. And what many people don't realize, we also have certified education services that have nothing to do with product. We can teach you the biomechanics of function and mobility moves and things like that for your trainers or your staff. So when you think of Life Fitness, we hope you think of us as an education resource. Today's focus is on SciFit, active aging product education, rehab, prehab solutions, and of course, CECs from SciFit, from uh, Life Fitness Academy, as well as Indoor Cycle Group. We have some absolute rock stars when it comes to teaching and engaging group cycle uh, program, and we have the products and technology to support that. So if you were to uh, look to uh, deliver a new group cycle experience, we have the ability to train and educate your staff so you don't just get shiny new bikes and then don't know how to maximize the invest investment. Oh, by the way, CECs are available there as well so that you can benefit from the education and of course stay certified um, along the way. Uh, so again, that's the big thing from um, from me when you think of life fitness and you think of our training and education resources. Um, the last uh, quick thing before we kick it over to, to Stacy is that when you think of life fitness, remember we are five uh, different brands underneath that umbrella of life fitness. So that's life fitness, cardio and strength, that's hammer strength, um, that's uh, strength equipment, plates, bars, dumbbells, that's Cybex cardio and strength, indoor cycling group, bikes, of course, and then the SciFit products that you're most likely already familiar with. And so that is our umbrella where we are able to provide, you know, a variety of options and solutions um, and uh, all of the different needs that you need in your J. So at this point, I'm going to quickly introduce Stacy and then let her give you her background here on the next slide as she is our um, resident expert from SciFit with her 17 years of experience as our sales and education manager for that specific brand based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and she's going to talk us through um, all of the different ways that we can engage with active agers. So at this point, Stacy, the floor is yours and thank you so much for the content today. All right. Thank you, Forrest, and thank you, JCC team. Um, welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining this session today. So um, we are going to talk about aging today, and I'd like to start off by kicking off with a poll um, just to kind of have a little fun to kick off our day. So as we talk about aging, if you were to choose any age to stay at for the rest of your life, which would it be? Under 10, 10 to 20? 20 to 35, wow, that's getting some good activity there. 35 to 50, 55 to 65, and 65 plus. So I'll give you a couple more seconds and we'll end our polling here. It's amazing, the 20 to 35 and the 35 to 50. Uh, there's a lot going on in those age ranges. Being retired would be cool. I just don't know what that would be like. So like, I can't <laughs> click that button yet. Right. So, uh, yeah, with, I mean, they're starting families and, you know, just uh, everything in that 20 to 35 range. So it looks like we actually have a tie 20 to 35 and 35 to 50. So that's pretty cool to see. I'm surprised I didn't get any 65 plus, but we are going to focus on that today, whether you like it or not. Right. Um, and get a better get a better gauge on that. In fact, most people in this age range. Um, in the 65 and older age range, kind of often say that is their favorite age range. And there's some reasons for that. You know, they have some freedoms from things like going to school, oftentimes going to work because many of them are retired. Um, they have freedoms from being a parent or being a caregiver for a parent. And they have freedoms to do things like take a nap when they want or watch TV or travel the world or volunteer or, or learn a new thing. So it's kind of like an age range where 
they're not accountable for somebody else every day and not dependent on others to take care of them. And so I think that's why oftentimes it is seen as, as a fun age range to be in. So I'm gonna kick it off here. We are gonna talk about some demographic changes taking place with this age range, along with some programming considerations with some common um, conditions as mentioned in the, in the intro as well. I can get my slides going here. Here we go. So we'll kick it off by saying happy birthday to the 10,000 people turning 65 years old today and every day. Um, as it relates to the number of Americans, this age group is going is projected to nearly double from 2018 being about 52 million to about 95 million by 2060. So here in the next few decades, it's just going to continue to multiply because of this baby boomer generation and also the lifespan um, impacted as well. As it relates to these older adults, the fastest growing age segment currently is the 85 plus. Um, and this isn't just, I know there might be some other people from other countries on here. This isn't just a US thing. It's actually a rather global phenomenon as we look at lifespans and just the aging population in general. All right, our next slide here. I'm not gonna focus too much on the top here, but I do wanna kind of show you that this trophy picture of 1960 is now looking more like a rectangular. That just goes to show you the increase in number of older adults as we get older. But then also wanna talk about men versus women in this age group. It comes as no surprise over the past several decades, or you know, just as in, in time and history, that female lifespan tends to be longer than the male lifespan. And as we talk a little bit later in our presentation today, um, this really goes into consideration as we talk about social engagement. Um, with our older adults being engaged and socially connected as most women age 75 and older, excuse me, about half of the women age 75 and older live alone. And so we'll kind of bring that into, into more of the forefront as we talk about being socially connected a little bit later on. Where I really wanna focus in is on this graph in the lower right. So there's gonna be a pivotal time in history that's gonna take place in the next 13 to 14 years. So the year 2034, 2035, it's gonna have this huge shift in our demographics, whether there's actually gonna be more people age 65 and older than there are youth um, or children 18 years and younger. So have that sink in for a moment. You know, How are you programming in your communities? Are you really focused on day camps and youth sports and children? Or are you giving um, a lot of programming considerations to your older adults? So just something to think about and possibly act on, especially as we go into the next decade where this pivotal time in history is gonna take place. Oops, went the wrong way here. All right, and then our last little graph for this morning really has to do with lifespan. Um, healthcare costs in the US are more than any other country in the world, but I wanna say the last research I saw on our health span or our lifespan related to other countries in the world, I think we rank in the US about 40 to 45. So there are many other countries that are living longer than we are in the US. But I will say our lifespan has increased over the past several decades. So we're just not to those levels like some other countries are. But I also wanted to focus on the bottom number here. Um, this is area or a, a time in history of our life where we're actually in a state of decline, where our health span is impacted by disease or chronic illness or cancer or those types of things that may impact our quality of life and our independence. And so in the US, we are probably one of the higher um, numbers at that bottom number that really we are in a state of decline for a longer period of time than many others. And so you may see this in your own communities as well, where there may be a health event like a stroke or a heart attack or a diagnosis of a chronic illness or another disease in which they wanna change their lifestyle habits. They wanna start being more um, attuned to their fitness and their wellness and wanna maximize their quality of life and manage those chronic illnesses. And so we need to take that into consideration, especially as they see themselves on their own fitness journey and kind of partnering up with them to help maximize that quality of life that they have. So the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about some levels of progression or modifications exercise precautions, and then kind of go into maybe some more of these age-related barriers that we have with these common conditions. So as we talk about levels of progression, um, most equipment in a fitness facility can be used for many ages and abilities. But I think the 
range of modifications or the ability to modify is important for all age groups, but we really focus on modifications a little bit more as we get older. Um, and this is where I struggle the most when I was training older adults many years ago. Um, coming fresh from college, I had all these great ideas. I wanted to get them all involved, but then I just went in and tried to change everything and I'm running into to walls because number one, they didn't know me. And number two, we didn't have that relationship. I didn't know what their abilities were. I didn't know what their comfort levels were with different equipment. And it just didn't work out very well. So I learned very early on that it may be good to do some assessments with our older adults, see what their abilities are, see what their comfort level is in trying new things, whether it's um, a select, selectorized equipment or cardio equipment, or what levels of modifications they may need in your programming. Do they need to sit in a chair? Do they need a, a chair for stability? Or can they be weight bearing without any assistance? So I think it's very important to get to know our members, our older adults, and really increase that relationship so that trust level can be there. And I think you'll see the most improvements when that trust and that relationship is grown with our older adult members. All right, so the first, um, I guess, conditional barrier that we'll talk about today really has to do with joint mobility. And this comprises several conditions, and this is just a snapshot of maybe some of the more common ones around arthritis or joint replacements, bone loss, muscle loss, and those types of conditions as it relates to just our overall flexibility and joint mobility. Um, as it relates to muscle mass, um, we kind of start to, start to see a decline by the age of around 40. And that decline can increase as we get into our 60s and 70s. Um, now the decline of muscle mass can vary from person to person, obviously, but it's not uncommon to lose about three to 8% of muscle mass per decade. And so we have to really take that into consideration too of the importance of strength training and weight bearing activities with our older adults but also make them in a very safe way um, that's easier on their joints as well. Um, but I can, you know, you can only emphasize, you know, strength training is very important for our older adult members. At the same time, cardiac, you know, aerobic and cardio conditioning is very important too for heart health, to boost mood, and for those that may be obese or overweight to help reduce that excess weight that's putting pressure on their joints. And so I think it's important to encompass both a, a cardio and strength modality um, for our older adult members. But how do we do that? And what are some of the um, more appropriate exercises to carry out? So joint friendly exercise, you can do so much in the pool. Water activities are very low impact, swimming, water aerobics, um, yoga and Tai Chi are very, very popular too with our older adults. Um, and they have many great benefits beyond just um, being joint friendly. Many of them are used for balance programming as well, as you may have in your own in your own communities that you see. And maybe focus on very controlled movements that also have to do with breathing and everything like that. And Pilates is also very important and very popular too with our older adults because they are very joint friendly. As it relates to equipment on your fitness floor, you may want to consider a recumbent stepper, kind of a, a product similar to here where it's a user-defined movement, where the um, older adult member can choose how short or how long a stride they wanna take within a certain range. And so if they may have a bad day, if they have a flare up with arthritis and they can only move and shuffle their feet two inches, they could still use a recumbent stuffer. Whereas a two inch range of motion isn't gonna get you through a full bike revolution. And so I think a recumbent stuffer is just a great product for older adult members because it can meet them where they're at and help progress them along the way. Um, and many of these recumbent steppers also have built-in strength programs to where you basically can transform it into a leg press and a mid row to really capitalize the benefits of using the equipment. Um, so there's just, just something to consider if you don't already have something similar to that on your floor. To expand on that, um, many, many, many older adults and just many people in general of any age that go to physical therapy for some of these joint mobility challenges are released from care way, way too early. And so they seek out facilities and communities and, and other programs that have some similar modalities to what they use in therapy and kind of want to carry on to a rehab part two in an environment because they don't want to regress. They don't want to take two steps behind because um, you know, they're, they're no longer under care of a physical therapist anymore. 
but they still need to continue on with their range of motion, with their strength and with their flexibility somewhere else. And so um, I just encourage you, if you haven't been in contact and reached out to some local physical therapist, maybe you wanna see what they have on their floor. Maybe you already have similar equipment on your floor and just have that connection there. Partner up with those types of um, clinical, um, you know, outpatient therapy clinics and let them know that you can be an extension to their therapy um, once those um, patients have been discharged from care. As it relates to other joint-friendly exercise, muscle balance is extremely important as well. Um, when you are um, exercising, it's good to work your muscle groups in both directions. So for example, if you move your arms in the forward direction, it's good to move your arm in the reverse direction because if you're just focusing on one direction, that muscle group will become overbalanced and it can cause some disruption in the joint, which can, can lead to discomfort and possibly injury. Um, and as we talk about our older adults, one area that comes to mind, you know, from a visual standpoint of looking at many, many older adults has to do with their posture. So as I'm saying that, I probably need to sit up myself because I'm hunched over looking at the computer. But we often, we often see tight chest muscles and weak back muscles with our older adults, which can lead to, you know, just an overall out of alignment, can have a spiral effect to falls, which we'll talk about as well. And so as we talk about some modifications with our older adults as it relates to balance, there's so many different exercises. This is just a, a snapshot of some options that we can do. But again, it really goes back into knowing our members, knowing what their goals are, and also what their abilities are, that we can guide them into maybe um, some options that would be good for them in targeting these muscle groups that would be good for posture. So for example, a selectorized row machine, very great controlled motion that you can carry out. Um, but maybe that might not be what some of your members prefer to do. Maybe they prefer to do bands and just exercise like that or hold water bottles and start with that type of modality. Um, a rower is a great modality as well for our posture, but there's so much more benefits that you can do with a rower with lower body strength and overall cardio conditioning. Um, but is it for everyone? Maybe not. It's a little bit more of an advanced modality. Um, but there's so many benefits with it. And I've seen so many older adults really gravitate toward rowers myself. Upper body exercisers are also very popular um, because you, again, you're working upper body arms, your back, your core. And this is just shows a picture of an upper body exerciser in which the crank arm is kind of flipped around. So normally when you're using an upper body exerciser, one hand is at the 12 o'clock position and one hand's at the six o'clock position and you're going to go in more of a rotary motion this way. You can flip it around, and we do this a lot in our senior living communities when we do training, and go in the reverse motion. It really pulls your shoulders back together. Again, just adds variety and just a, a different type of modality to use. And then in some of your classes, you know, the good old shoulder circles, that's always a good one to, to you know, really loosen up your shoulder joint and everything like that. Doing Ws, I think, is another thing that you can do. You can do it up against the wall and touch your elbows to the wall. You can do it from a seat. You can do it standing and have a seat there for stability. So there's a, a wide range of exercise options to do, but also different modifications within those options that you could carry out just as some suggestions. All right. So some exercise precautions as it relates to joint mobility. Um, limit high impact exercises, the concussive running, jumping, jerking motions um, can really put added force and shear on the knees and joints. Um, also for those that are more susceptible for um, with osteoporosis or osteopenia, more at risk for fractures with those concussive movements, but weight bearing activities are very important. Just limit the high impact exercises. Um, as it relates to bending and curvature of the spine, this really does have to do with osteoporosis. Um, they're, they're, the spinal column is so fragile with those individuals and um, just limiting toe touches, abdominal crunches, those types of things with, with excessive curvature of the spine. Another exercise precaution for joint mobility really has to do with knee, knee protection. And I know in, in my days of training, we always say, you know, don't lock out your knees or have soft knees, but I think it's very important, you know, especially with this population around joint mobility, um, if you're on a recumbent bike, you know, really cue them to not have their legs at full extension through the range of motion. Have about a 10 degree bend as they're going through that range of motion. If they're on a leg press, you 
know, make sure they don't lock out their knees, you know, going through that movement as well. Um, typically in our classes, when we do lunges and squats, our body kind of tells us how far we can go. I know mine already does, unless I'm fully warmed up. And so having, you know, just limiting those deep lunges and deep squats, um, I think is good for that knee protection as well. Now medications, I threw this in here as an exercise precaution. Um, it doesn't really have to do with joint mobility, but since it's with the exercise precautions, I went ahead and, and added it to the slide. So <clears throat> you may have members who um, take some medications that can affect how their exercise heart rate and blood pressure um, react. And so if they are new to exercise, they may not know, you know how that works in tandem. Or if they are new to medications, again, they may not know how those interact. So just some things to be aware of. If you do have, excuse me, <clears throat> if you do have any members who are on um, beta blockers, that can impact their exercise and heart rate blood pressure. And so in the age of wearables, when everyone's wearing a watch, you know, 220 minus your age, getting your heart rate zone, those types of things really doesn't apply for someone on beta blockers um, because their heart rate is gonna show much lower than what their exercise intensity really is. And so we often just refer to um, an RPE chart or rate of per perceived exertion chart, you know, with one being a smiley face and 10 being in, oh, I'm sweating bullets, you know? Um, so they can gauge their level of intensity by that type of charting mechanism versus what their heart rate's showing. Um, likewise, if you do have members on ACE inhibitors and diuretics, also common medications for high blood pressure, um, those can impact you know, their blood pressure, say, post-exercise. So for example, if you're exercising and you stopped abruptly and you're on these types of medications, it can cause your, cause your blood pressure to really plummet and go really low, which can cause the you know, feeling it dizzy or feeling faint. And so it's so important to have a really good cool down. And I'll say it's a good cool down if you have a joint mobility condition or not, um, but especially if you're on these medi medications for high blood pressure, to have a really good cool down to regulate your blood pressure and get it into a stable state. Likewise, it's also good if you have a good warm up, um, especially if you do have some of these joint mobility conditions we talked about, to get the blood flowing, to get your muscles and your joints lubricated. Um, and get you geared up for your main exercise part of the wor workout. <clears throat> you know, I say a warm up being a dynamic warm up, meaning big, large movements versus those static stretch starts. You know, you can you can save the stretching um, to the end of your exercise during the cool down, but for the warm up, practice those big movements to really get the blood flowing. All right. So our next category we're going to talk about are on falls. I think we have another poll that we're gonna put up on the screen here. You can help me with that. It says, does your JCC offer programs focused on fall risk reduction or balance? Yes, we have programs and do balance assessments. Yes, we have programs only or no. So we'll give this a few seconds and kind of see where we're at. Oh, wow. Okay. Still moving around a little bit. We have 36% saying, yes, you do balance and assessments, 37%, 38%, going up higher. That's great to see. Oh, 40%, awesome. And then yes, we have programs only is 36%, 39%, 40%, okay. And then no, I think it's showing like 21%. It's kind of cut off my, am I seeing that right, 21%? Yeah, I think that adds up to 100. <laughs> so, um, so great. So it looks like 80, at least 80% of, um, the participants today on the call have some type of balance programming that you're doing. That's amazing to see. That's, I've got chills just listening to that so, or, or hearing those, those um, results. Because falls are a leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries and <clears throat> can definitely impact the quality of care and have enormous you know, economic impact on our society as well. So here's just some, a few alarming stats as it relates to falls. One in four adults fall every year. In fact, I think that's closer to one in three um, right now anyway. Falling once doubles your chance of falling again. Studies show that 95% of hip fractures are caused by falling and usually falling to the side because they don't have that lateral stability and support, which we'll, we'll focus on here in a few slides. Um, falls generate 34 billion in direct medical care costs annually. 
And then the, one of the latest stats from the CDC is if rates continue as anticipated by 2030, so less than 10 years away, there will be seven fall deaths every hour. Ah, oh, it's crazy. And with that comes this vicious cycle. Um, and just to kind of give you a backstory, my husband and I helped take care of his grandma the last two and a half years of her life. And before that, she was very independent. She lived by herself, but she you know, did medication management, meal prep, went to the grocery store, got her hair done, went to lunch you know, with her friends and sister quite a bit. Um, but she had a fall in her home and was an inpatient rehab for a while, came home and was a completely different woman. Um, I think one of the first purchases she had was a lazy boy recliner that had a swivel. And she basically lived in that chair. Oftentimes she slept in that chair, but we would go over on the weekends, do her medication management, meal prep, whatever, try to walk her around. Um, but she just resorted to this very sedentary lifestyle, which led to muscle atrophy and weakness and ultimately led to another fall that she couldn't recover from. So while that's a sad story, there are many, many others in our communities and many others that you may have had direct impact with as well that have been um, a similar story to that. But the good news is uh, there's solutions in place and it sounds like you have some solutions going on to help trigger these trends going back in the other direction for the positive. So we will focus on some risk factors just to kind of look at the root causes for falls and then some um, other solutions maybe that you can incorporate to your existing balance programs that you already have in place. So some risk factors for falls, lower body weakness. Um, I think 24%, I think we're saying that that's 24% uh, of falls are really attributed to lower body weakness. So we'll kind of focus on that more because that really relates to more of the fitness side of things anyway. Vitamin D deficiency, now that's an interesting one, but there's been many studies that correlate vitamin D to equal low muscle strength. And I think a lot of that has to do with how vitamin D regulates calcium transport into the muscle cells and help with contraction. It also is very important in protein synthesis and repairing muscle fibers and building new muscle fibers. And so that's where that connection was in, in mo low muscle strength and increased falls with vitamin D. Use of some medications you know, can cause dizziness and feeling unbalanced. Um, obviously, if you have difficulties with walking and balance, you're more at risk for fall. Um, but take into consideration, again, posture earlier. If, you're, if your posture is, is poor, often leads that your um, center of gravity is out of alignment, you're more susceptible to be you know, feeling unbalanced and lead to a fall as well. Vision and vestibular problems. So as we get older, oftentimes our visual acuity, our perception can become more impaired and us being able to navigate and walk can lead to split trips and falls as well. Um, there are some balance testing that really kind of roll out, you know, the vestibular inner ear versus vision versus some other somatosensory, um, you know, imbalances that are going on there as far as the root causes are. So you can kind of get to the root cause and know where to focus from there. Um, foot pain and poor, poor foot wear. Um, and talk about diabetic neuropathy or feeling tingling or numbness in your feet. Again, if you're walking upstairs and you don't know that your foot is fully on that step, you could lead to a slip, trip, or fall as well. Um, poor footwear, I don't know if that really um, is a big concern in your communities or not, but when I do trainings in senior living facilities and the wellness floor or wellness room is down the hall, you see everything on the footwear come in there from slippers to Sunday's vest. Um, but I will say that I have seen many, many people that shuffle their feet when they walk, wear slippers, and I'm like, oh, you're, you're at danger for falling. So getting good footwear is very important. And then there's the extrinsic or environmental dangers that can come into play. And these are things that you can kind of be attuned to in your own community as it relates to rugs or mats or broken concrete or uneven steps and those types of things that you can kind of look at, um, maybe highlight if you can't fix them in the initially, um, but removing those rugs and those other clutter that can lead to a slip, trip or fall is important too. All right, so as we talk about lower body weakness, you know, that is a primary concern for, for falls. Um, weak hip abductors and weak quadriceps have led to increased sway and increased um, falls to the side or lateral falls because they don't have that support on the side. Um, also tight hip flexors and inhibited glutes can also contribute to joint pain, walking discomfort, and other postural challenges as well. 
So there are some uh, modalities that you can consider in your floor um, or in your programming considerations that really target these muscle groups um, to help limit and build lower strength to limit falls. Um, may want to consider a, a seated lateral trainer, for example. This product, if you've never seen a lateral trainer, there are some that are more weight bearing where you're standing, which require a lot more learning curve. Um, and then there's those that are seated in, in a safe supported manner that really can broaden the population segment who can use the equipment. But it's where you're seated and you're moving your legs side to side, if you can see my hands, like a wax on, wax off with your legs and you're really focusing on your medial glutes, your hip abductors and your quads. And it's very efficient in targeting those muscle groups. Um, in fact, there was a, a study done by a college in Nebraska that used older adult women as the, the participants and they did balance testing prior to using a product like this. Um, and then also had the participants use a product like this for uh, 15 minutes a day, three times a week for one month, and then did balance testing at the end. And they showed pretty significant improvements in just using it during that short time. Um, another product that really targets these muscle groups has to do with a hip abductor, adductor machine like this. Um, there are a wide range of these. I would recommend those that have a, what we call closed chain, meaning your feet are supported. So that makes it joint friendly that way. Other ones that don't have your feet supported, your knees may be out of alignment. So this is a very controlled movement that really focuses on your hip abductors and adductors. Functional trainers, um, cable machines, um, or a product like what you see here, what we call core sticks. You can practice those functional movements that we do in everyday life. Sit to stand is very important. And so you can do this safely with some types of functional trainers. Um, and there's a wide variety of options that you have those you know, available with cable machines or other types of modalities there. And then in your just general fitnessing programs, you know, practice your, your side steps or your lateral stepping. Um, because in everyday life, we move forward, we move backward, we move side to side. And so practicing in those different planes of movement will really make repetition is key, right? And so making it really you know, come to life with them in their everyday you know, living activities that they do. All right, another area of lower body weakness that we often overlook really has to do with ankle mobility. Um, and then with ankle mobility, uh, as we get older, it often is a little bit more difficult to bring our toes up to our shin, what we call dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion is needed to, to walk appropriately, to get over those curbs, to get up steps, to drive a car. Um, you may see some older adults that have compromised gait or limited dorsiflexion that have the shuffle movement that don't really pick up their feet. But I think it's very important to have that ankle mobility to help be more nimble to walk over those objects that they may be more of a tripping hazard and also help navigate up, upstairs and drive cars and those types of things. So you can do 10 you know, circles to the right, 10 circles to the left, get creative, write your name with your ankle. Um, this level of modifications, you can do hill digs and plantar flexion. So you can do this from a standing position or from a seated position and really work on that plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, ankle mobility. All right. And then the last segment that we're really gonna talk about as far as just overall um, age-related conditions that um, can affect our quality of life and everything really have to do with our brain. And brain health is so important. In many surveys to older adults kind of put dementia as their most scary condition. And dementia is really an umbrella term that comprises you know, many layers of conditions under cognitive impairment. Um, whether that has to do with personality changes, difficulties with communi communicating and thinking, or just overall um, decreased concentration and memory. Dementia affects 47 million people worldwide. Um, I think the most common form of dementia that we are most familiar with is Alzheimer's and 60% of dementia cases are Alzheimer's. 33% um, of people age 85 and older actually have Alzheimer's. So while there isn't necessarily a cure for Alzheimer's or dementia right now, there are some preventive measures that we can take to help limit us from getting these types of conditions. Um, staying physically active, which we've kind of talked about um, the importance of staying physically active and how that is on our brain. We'll, we'll focus that on here in a little bit. Staying socially connected, coming from a pandemic year, it's been very much a challenge. Um, 
participating in mentally stimulating activities or education, learning experiences. Nutrition is very important. Your sleeping or sleep habits are very important. Um, not smoking and limiting alcohol use are also very important as well. So as it relates to exercise or staying physically active, you may have seen it, you know, this type of diagram before um, or pictorial before um, or something similar. But I think it, sometimes we just forget how exercise impacts our brain. It's just so complex in how our body works together in unison and, and can feed off each other in different areas. But when we exercise, just a 20 minute walk, you know, you have increased breathing, you have increased blood flow, blood flow with oxygen to your brain, releasing proteins to help nourish neurons or create new neurons, and also releasing neurotransmitters like serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine, which can help with concentration and boost your mood. And I could go on and on, but, um, and help with sleep as well. And so all that goes on with just a 20 minute walk. And so I think it's just very important to kind of visually see this from time to time to really see that our brain um, is affected by exercise. Um, and so we can, we can spend more time on that as well. Um, but then moving on over to the socially connected part, right? You all remember the Golden Girls. You have four widows living together, providing each other with companionship, friendship, and emotional support. Um, that's not the norm. You know, 28% in our community actually live alone. And coming from this past 12 months when we've been socially isolated and quarantined and social distance, it's been very difficult to stay connected with our older adults. Um, it's been very encouraging to see how technology has been on the forefront in helping us stay connected and how we get creative in having those touch points with some of our older adult members. Um, I've, I've heard some many people have you know, book clubs, virtual book book clubs, or digital online fitness classes, or um, bingo day on Zoom or whatever. And so this is great to see that we, we've been creative and trying to find ways and staying socially connected with our older adults. But I know that we've, we haven't been able to touch everybody. And I know there were people coming into your facilities that that was a place they went. That was their go-to for, for their social connections. And so hopefully we can get back to that or have a hybrid of that very soon. Um, and I'd be interested to see what level of um, encouragement and engagement you've had with your own communities. I think, I think it's, it's good that we feed off each other and network and learn from each other in those areas. Um, there, this age group is also usually have a lot of time. So they can be your number one volunteer. Um, they find great purpose and contribute so much to a, to a cause and, and participating in a certain task. And then dual tasking. So dual tasking, if you're not familiar with, with this phrase, it's kind of like a fancy term for multitasking, really. But dual tasking combines a cognitive thinking activity, say talking, with a motor skill like walking. Um, as we get older, uh, it can be more and more difficult to do two things at the same time. Um, oftentimes, if you ask an older adult a question while they're walking, they'll stop or they'll have a compromised gait, a shuffle, or they'll be off balance. Um, and we'll find many, many geriatric clinicians now do balance assessments that aren't strictly just on standing on one foot for 30 seconds or closing your eyes for 30 seconds. We'll find them doing these dual tasking type cues and seeing how well they are when added distractions are brought in while they're walking or while they're going up a stair or that type of thing. <clears throat> so you can incorporate dual tasking in some of your programming. Um, and I will say this is fun for all ages. Um, my, I did this with my son during, especially last spring when we were stuck at home. So, um, but here's some ideas for the actual motor skills. And I think it's very important to focus on the big, smooth movements. It's not about how fast we move, but you really wanna focus on those big, smooth movements because when you're tasked with a cognitive thinking and then communicating it out, sometimes we, we retract. And so I think it's good to really focus on marching in place with big arms and big steps. Lateral stepping, as we kind of talked about earlier, stepping to the side, going back. Squats or sit to stand. Um, are another good um, motor skill that you can do when incorporating dual tasking. And you can do um, dual tasking using cardio and strength products as well. 
So I'll kind of give some ideas on um, some of those options here in a few slides or here in a minute as well. As it relates to cognitive thinking, um, you can use numbers a lot. You can count it by threes, three, six, nine, 12. You can subtract by threes from 50. Um, you can name animals or food groups in alphabetical order um, and then objects by color. So I'll tie this together to give an example. Um, say for example, my little 2D drawing over here, um, you're gonna do lateral stepping, okay? Every time you step to the right, you're gonna count up by three. So we'll go three, back over, six, back over, nine, 12. You can do, um, so it'd be very uniform in a class environment by doing that. You can add a little organized chaos by doing um, animals in alphabetical order. So everybody might have a different answer, but you can have fun with this. So you, so you can do ant, bear, cat, dog, and those types of movements that way. Um, another layer of complexity, this is good for a squat or a sit to stand movement, but you can label your arms and your legs a number so that your left arm would be one, your right arm would be two, your left leg would be three, and your right leg would be four. As an instructor, you go down to a squat and then you call out a number, one. So everybody would lift up their left arm really big, you go down to a squat, say the number three, and then you lift, you, you know, stand on your, your right leg and you lift up number three on your foot. And so you're working on your squat, this is your leg strength. You're working on, okay, which arm is one again and tying your arm to a certain number. And then you're also working on balance if you're doing three and four. So there's a lot going on there that can really utilize you know, your brain and tie your mind and your body together. Um, for naming objects by color, for example, you can play uh, an adult version of I Spy. Um, I, I still do this with my son. But with I Spy, you can be in a room, whether virtually or in a class, and you know, maybe you go down to a squat and you say the green. They would span the room, find an object green, and communicate what that object is. So again, they're working on leg strength of the squat. They're spanning the rooms. They're using their visual acuity and also vestibular by moving their neck at the same time, <clears throat> locating an object and communicating it out. So there's, again, you can make it very simple or complex in how you incorporate dual tasking. If you do it on cardio and strength products, um, you can use a timer on cardio equipment and every five seconds or 10 seconds, you know, say whatever is in sequence of whatever game you're playing. And then on the strength side with every repetition, um, you can again, verbalize on that cognitive aspect as well. So the sky's the limit and how you can use dual tasking. You might wanna just do, you know, the last five, 10 minutes of your class and just add a layer of variety and fun um, with some of these options here. As it relates to other brain games you can incorporate, if you're in a class, um, you can like have a card at the beginning of your session where it would have you know four pictures and a number and a color. Um, so a beach, dog, tennis, coffee, the number 1479 and the color is gold. And then at the end of the exercise session, you can just have fun and see how many people can recall what was on the card at the beginning of the, the, um, the class. Um, you could also have something similar, you know, set up at the reception area where, you know, you can have a little, you know, something set up there to remember. And then when they leave, you know, just kind of have fun and see if they still remember some of those objects listed there so, to kind of trigger some of that short term memory. Um, hey, I might cue you, you guys at the end of this and see if if you pass the quiz. So take take hold of these pictures here. Beach, dog, tennis, coffee, the number 1479. All right, music is medicine too. You know, as far as incorporating music into your classes and also just on the fitness floor, I think it's good to have that background to help boost mood. Um, I think it's also important to have your members participate in the selection of music as well. Um, they can get more engaged when they actually, you know, are choosing some of the music that's being played. Um, but take hold uh, and just be, you know, um, kind of aware of how, Vocals, especially if you're doing a lot of cueing or dual tasking in your class, may interfere with how they're um, hearing your cues as well, you know, especially if they do have a, a hearing device. Um, and that goes into the play with the volume as well. Um, Max the tempo with the music. You know, we, we see older adults doing kid programs at 
170 beats per minute sometimes all the way down to you know 60 70 beats per minute so just incorporating and you all are probably great at doing that in your classes um, matching the tempo of the music with the um, exercise movements that you're carrying out and this picture down here just shows a um, senior living community about 30 miles north of my house that went viral here in February where they incorporated stability balls in a whole new level. They kind of used them as drums and then got some dowel rods and they focused on so many things with these exercise sessions and had a blast. Um, they did gross motor skills with big movements. They did fine motor skills by tapping the ball and they did it in rhythm. So there was a lot of going on with their brain and keeping up with the uh, the rhythm and patterning of the, of the music along with their movements. So, um, I don't know, just an adding suggestion there. I thought it was pretty cool, so I'm gonna include it. As it relates to older adult exercises, um, I think it's important to incorporate product variety. Um, upper body exercise um, is very important. Most of our activities of daily living really incorporate you know, our um, lifting groceries, lifting grandkids, um, turning, pulling, pushing. And so having an upper body exerciser can complement um, those traditional you know, activities of daily living, living that we do. Lower body exercise um, is very important, whether it's a treadmill or become a bike, you know, those kind of are more of the popular modalities for older adults. Um, total body products, as we mentioned earlier, the recumbent stepper is often you know, a, a favorite or become an elliptical um, because they can get a total body exercise, get a lot of muscle activation from a safe and supported seated position. Uh, <clears throat> dependent motion products, really this is good for those that may have some limited mobility, um, say those recovering from a stroke. Um, they can use the strength of one part of their body to drive back the motion and circulation in another part of their body. And so that might be something to consider as well. But I think it's very important that programming or in your exercise products that you have, that you're incorporating movements in multiple planes, forward, backward, side to side, turning, because that's how we move in everyday life. And as it relates to more of your cardio equipment that you may have, um, I think it's important just as staff members that they're familiar with the equipment themselves and the programs that are there so they can better um, carry on to or relay that information over to the older adults, um, especially if they know what their goals are or um, how they wanna carry on with the equipment. So are they wanting just a five minute warm up? Then go to quick start. If they're wanting more assessments, is that something available? Um, are they wanting to be able to document or show their improvement over time? Um, so kind of knowing the equipment and, and relaying over to them what the best programs are for them to, to carry out to meet their goals is very important. As it relates to older adults and just in general with our population, um, there are 3.6 million people that use wheelchairs. Um, not all of these are older adults, but many of them are in that age segment. And I think it's important, you know, especially on your fitness floor, that you have equipment to meet all ages and abilities, but those that are, are wheelchair accessible as well. So um, just want to make note that there are a wide variety of options there that can accommodate elite athletes and those in wheelchairs at the same time. Um, and so there's a wide variety of options that can, can meet those needs. And as it relates to accessories, um, there are many accessories available with cardio and strength equipment, um, whether it's a seat belt to help with posture or, or to keep more upright or assist clothes for those that might have some gripping challenges. Um, for those that may have the inability of keeping their foot on a pedal, drop foot, um, there might be some, some supported pedals available as well. Um, so while you might not need all these accessories for your equipment, just know that many manufacturers have these as options and they can always be most of the time added after the fact to meet a, you know, a particular need that you have. As it relates to chairs, um, I think it's very important to have a very comfortable chair. Um, we'll get calls from customers and they'll try to describe a product that they use somewhere, especially this past year. I, I, you know, since my gym is closed, I want that product that I used at the gym. I'm like, well, describe the product. Well, it's the one with the comfortable chair. You know, that's like the first thing they go to. And so making sure that they're comfortable is very important. Um, but if you're doing programming in your class, you want something that's portable, 
but yet stable enough so that's not going to scoot across the floor. So nothing on wheels or nothing that's so lightweight that's going to scoot if they're going to put some support on it. Also, you want to have a little bit more freedom of movement. So limit the arm rest and that type of thing to allow for um, full range of motion with their upper body and lower body while they're seated. Um, and then on your cardio equipment, you know, there are a lot of options there for adjustable seats, um, especially those that may have some joint mobility conditions. Having a height adjustable seat that also may recline can really put somebody maybe with a hip or a knee condition in an ideal position to exercise. Um, and an adequate user weight capacity, I think that's pretty standard now with most manufacturers and, and a wide variety of member populations. So as we kind of wrap up here, some safety features to consider too for older adults. You know, you might not need handrails for all your equipment, but you might want to consider, you know, one or two treadmills that um, really have extended handrails to add another layer of safety and security for them to get on and off and to, and to use, you know, possibly if needed while, while they're walking on the treadmill. As I mentioned, comfortable sturdy seats are always something to, um, you know, keep on the forefront as um, features to look out for in equipment. And then many manufacturers actually have sturdy grab bars, um, welded steel grab bars um, to use when they get up and out of the seat. And so um, look at your fitness floor and kind of look at where the handhold would be. Not a flimsy piece of plastic, but you know, usually there's a good solid piece that you can kind of guide your older adults. Hey, put your hand here to help you get up and out of the, out of the seat safely. As I mentioned, accessories, you know, um, are very popular um, for our older adults, especially um, if there's some special needs there to consider. And those can always, you know, typically be added after the fact. Also on your treadmills, you may want to consider a slow starting speed or some built-in safety measures and how the speed increments are, are considered um, to change as well. So as we wrap up here, just continue to reach out to your older adults because number one, the population isn't going anywhere, it's growing. As we mentioned here in about 13, 14 years, the age of 65 and older population is gonna outnumber our youth. Um, oftentimes our older adults are referred by medical need. As I mentioned, you know, in the physical therapy world, they're discharged from care way too early. Um, in addition to that, cardiac and pulmonary rehab, they're discharged way too early. And then to add another layer of complexity to that, we're seeing COVID therapy now in which um, we've seen many, many patients say, I have to exercise or I'm gonna be back on oxygen again. And so I think it's very important to, you know, open up your doors and let them know that you have some modalities available to accommodate whatever need they have um, as they're um, wanting to maximize their quality of life and, and minimize the impact of whatever condition they're going through because you, you can impact their lives, their quality of life. It's so rewarding to be in a spot where you're at in, in your communities and being on the, the front lines in addressing their health and their well-being. So that's all I have um, for us. If we wanna carry on, I don't know if we have any questions in the chat panel. We might have just a couple minutes left, right? Just a minute or two. We got a quick question about what's the brand name of the exercise piece that has those two sticks? Why don't you elaborate on the SciFit Core Sticks real yeah, quick? Yeah. So Core Sticks is a functional trainer. It comes with seven sets of sticks. So each set of stick is like a dis different resistance. So you can um, vary your resistance or your intensity by the different sticks that you use. You can do um, upper body exercise, lower body exercise, a lot of core training. And then a uh, very popular for the older adults is just practicing that, that sit to stand where you can actually put a chair behind them and do the sit to stand from there. So there's a lot of different modalities. Um, you could go to the SciFit website or our YouTube channel and there's video content available as well. So you can click on an exercise. It'll tell you what to do as your virtual trainer. Yeah, that's a super versatile piece that really applies um, for exercises of all fitness levels, but definitely for our active agers, that's absolutely perfect. So thank you for clarifying there. Um, and yeah, for me, it's always the dual tasking. I always forget to remember, <laughs> maybe I should do some dual tasking, <laughs> that dual tasking is a way to really engage, you know, multiple different pieces of that entire cognitive experience and physical experience for, uh, for active agers. So yeah, Stacy, thank you. This was awesome. Uh, just a reminder, uh, again, for everybody, we posted it a few times, make sure you fill out your email address in that Google form so we can send you the recording. 
and the quiz for the CEC. And then you can re-forward that email to any of your staff that needs CECs. They will be able to then watch the recording of this presentation and take the quizzes and earn the free CEC. So we will be over at the, uh, the virtual exhibitor hour here in just a minute. Um, I will and my counterpart, Gary, uh, and we will be available to answer any other questions. And I think Jordan, that we can hang tight here for just a minute or two longer, um, if you would uh, clarify that for everyone. But y'all, we just can't thank you enough for being a part of the ProCon and just excited to connect with you, learn how reopening is going and, and, and partner in any way that we can with your exercisers as they come back to the facilities. Thank you, Stacy and Forrest. This was a very informative session. I certainly learned a lot. Um, yes, Andy has put the link to the um, Life Fitness Virtual Vendor Hall booth in the um, in the chat. I'm just going to make one quick announcement and then you can feel free to stay on here since Forrest and Stacy are here as well if you'd like to ask any specific questions either in the chat or directly to them. Um, thank you both so much for being here and for sponsoring this session and the ProCon 2021. Um, if you have a trusted advising session, use the link that was sent to you to meet your advisor right after this session. Uh, and please join us at 3 p.m. for the closing movement moment. Um, close out your 2021 ProCon experience amidst, amongst thousands of your peers at the final JCC movement moment, Power in Community. We'll be joined by experienced JCC professionals and professionals from beyond the movement to engage in a roundtable discussion on the imperative of cross-community collaboration that comprises the linking of arms, hearts, and minds. So thank you so much. Again, if you'd like to stay on here for a moment, um, I'm sure Forrest and Stacy can answer any questions. <laughs>